Okay, so we ended off on the last section, which was talking about undermodeling. And what we showed was that if, and this was the big if, there is no undermodeling, and somehow we can estimate the true parameters, two big ifs, then the effect was that we could achieve the same error as if we knew what the true function was. And this suggested, at least from this perspective, that you should try to make the model class as large as possible. For example, if you're having a polynomial model class, you want to have a very, very high order, like a 14th order polynomial or something like that, to make sure that the undermodeling is zero or very close to zero. But I said that at least when you have limited amounts of data, there are problems when you have a very large model class. And to understand that, we need to introduce a very important concept, which is bias and variance. Let me introduce, let me define what these two terms are. So the bias is just formally defined as this. It's whatever the true function is, and the expected value of the estimate. And the variance is just the expected square difference between the estimate and its average value. Now, that's a mathematical formula. Well, there are two mathematical formulas, but let me try to just ex understand conceptually what they mean. So the kind of the expectation is both of the terms, bias and variance, are kind of um, you can imagine them the following conceptual experiment. Imagine that I somehow had many independent data sets. So I could, I have 100 points and then I have another 100 points and then I have another 100 points. And for each 100 data points, I get estimates from the training data. And then the bias and variance is, the bias is computed somehow on the average of this. And the variance is computed by sort of the variance on, across these different trials, if you like. Now, of course, in reality, you only have one training set. So this is a completely theoretical computation. It sort of imagines you conceptually that you could rerun this experiment. But um, this will be very useful as a conceptual framework to try to understand generalization error. Before we um, go further, I think it's useful if we try to visualize what bias and variance are. So let's start with bias and let's go back to our polynomial example. You can actually see the code in the GitHub site uh, to produce these graphs, but I'm not going to show the code here. It's not that important. All right. So if you recall, what we were doing in that example is that we had a true relationship, which was the red line. And now just to go through this concept experiment that defines bias and variance, I imagine that I have a large number of trials. So I don't take generate one data set. I generate 100 data sets. And in each data set, I get an estimate. And on this estimate, I compute, um, uh, I compute the average, I compute a function estimate, and then I compute the average across these different trials, right? So this, this concept. And that average is plotted here in this uh, dotted blue line. And I look at that for three different model orders. In one case, I'm uh, picking just a linear functions for the estimate, then cubics, and then a very high order function. Now, the bias is just that difference between the true function and the average value. So on this graph is shown here. Now, what do we see? We see that when the model order is very low, the bias is high. That's because the true function in this case is cubic, but I'm restricting my model to only look at linear functions. So of course, there's going to be a discrepancy, at least at certain points, between the model and true function. On the other hand, when the model order is equal to or greater than the true function, um, then we, the bias is zero in this case. On average, we're able to estimate this perfectly, right? So the idea here 
is that when there's a very low model order, we have a high bias or a high level of underfitting, which goes away when we pick um, a higher model order. Again, this is seeming to suggest that we should try to pick very high model orders to be over here. But there's a different issue, which is the variance. Again, I've plotted the same thing. The red curve is the true curve. The green solid line is the mean of the estimate. And those little bars are the error bars here, which represent the variance. So in this case, plotted as the standard deviation across these different trials. And now what do we see here? When there's a very low um, um, model order, the variance is very small, so that if you rerun the experiment, you tend to get a line which looks quite close to the average value. As I increase the model order, we see that the variance, those vertical error bars, increases, and we're getting an even higher increase here in this model, like this. Now look at this, what we see. There's kind of a trade-off. On the one hand, picking low model orders gives you high bias, but you get low variance. All right? And on the other hand, when you pick high model orders, you eliminate the bias, but you get high variance. This trade-off is captured by a very important formula called the bias variance formula. So let's just recap our definitions. We have the function MSE, which is the difference between the true and estimated functions. We have the bias, which is the average of that difference. And we have the variance, which is the difference between the estimate and its average, or the variance around its average. And the bias variance formula just says that the function MSE is a sum of two terms, which is the bias squared and the variance squared. And this illustrates the basic trade-off. On the one hand, if you the bias is due to undermodeling. So it's reduced, as we saw, if we try to increase the model order. But on the other hand, if we try to increase the model order, it tends to increase the variance. We can illustrate that with this kind of graph here. So in this case, this is the function MSE, or the generalization error. And we have some measure of the model complexity, like the model order. On the one hand, if I pick very high model orders, the bias squared will go down. On the other hand, if I pick high model orders, the variance will go up. But the total error is the sum of these two. So there's some optimal value that's in between this. And this is what we need somehow to try to pick when we try to pick what is the best model order. We can go through the bias variance proof um, it's basically the same as what we did before. I'll just walk through it super fast. We let f bar be the average value of the estimate. And remember that the function MSE, then, we can write, because uh, the difference between f naught and f has a difference of these terms here. And then what we do is we just simply break them up into three components that we did before when we break out that sum. The first one is the sum of f naught minus f but that's just simply the bias, or the bias squared. M2 in this case here is the second term, which is just the variance, and then I won't walk through all the details here, but the cross term, it turns out, you can show is uh, zero. Now, I just want to make this more concrete for one specific case where we can compute the bias and variance. Exactly, and that's the case for linear models. In the next section on the, in the notes, in the slides, I walk through all the details, and you can do that, look at those on your, on your own. But let me just summarize some interesting results to make this a little more concrete. Suppose we looked at a linear model, where then we had n samples of data and p parameters uh, in that model. It turns out that you can show the following. The first, is that when the number of samples is less than the number of parameters, the linear estimate is not even unique. So basically, you can't even solve it. So we have to have always at least as many samples as you have parameters.
I think、um, one of the things that students have trouble with in their project is they see、um, very interesting neural networks with millions of parameters in them, and then they try to apply them to their data set, which is very small, and where the number of samples is much less than the number of parameters, and it invariably leads to trouble. So the first thing you need to do is either get a large data set or try to reduce the number of parameters. The second, for the second two results, let's assume that you have at least as many data points as you have parameters, and it turns out the following is the case. In this case,、um, there generally is no bias in a linear model. So once the、uh, estimate becomes unique, then the, there's no bias, and the only issue is the variance. And for the variance, it tends to scale under some conditions, like this, that it grows linearly with the number of parameters and linearly with the noise, but it decreases inversely with the number of samples. So the more samples you can get, you can reduce that variance error. So getting more samples is key, and if not, you want to try to reduce the number of parameters as much as possible.